Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm so honored to introduce our two speakers for our species profile on tiny nesting raptors here in Arizona. We have with us our very own Olia Weekly, who is our community science coordinator. I'm sure most of you on this call know, uh, know Olia already. And we are honored to have Mike Shaw from Hawkwatch International joining us today as well to talk about recent uh, research that he has about these tiny nesting raptors. So uh, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Olia. We can get started. Thank you so much. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with sound. <laughs> so I don't forget that part. All right. So you good. Can... Okay, thank you, appreciate that. All right, so thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, we had so much fun putting this presentation together. Um, I don't think there's not much else cuter than tiny raptors, especially tiny baby raptors. So, um, so let's dive right in. Um, birds have different nesting adaptations and preferences because they have different niches to fill in to reduce competition. In other words, if every single bird was nesting in the same exact manner, for example, in cavities, there wouldn't be enough to go around. So here are some of the most common nest types around here. You've got your open cup nest, like a typical, it looks like it's not. Sorry about that. I'm trying to change my slides. There we go. Okay, now you're actually seeing what I'm talking about. So you've got the open cup nests, like a typical finch nest. Um, you have platform nests that are more open, like a dove or a hawk nest. Ground nests are uh, the ones created by quail. And you've got a woven or a spherical type of nest a uh, burden would make or a cactus friend would make. And of course, the ones that we're going to be talking about today are cavities the ones that woodpeckers and elf owls are nesting in, purple martins, Lucy's warblers, I could go on and on. Saguaros are one of the top cavity provi providers around here. Um, Gila woodpeckers and gilded flickers are the two species who make holes in them. They don't always use the ones that they make. It's almost like a show off ritual for them to excavate a hole. So they often abandon old nesting cavities, which leaves some holes for other species to use. Woodpeckers head strikes um, with at least a thousand times the force of gravity, but it doesn't harm them. The woodpeckers have a special adaptation that prevents concussions. They have special bone, a special bone that acts kind of like a seatbelt for their skull. It wraps around the whole woodpecker skull. Their beaks are also designed to absorb the shock. And as they peck, um, they have a self-sharpening ability, which allows them to go deep into the wood instead of stopping abruptly. They also have an extra long tongue that's used to probe for insects and nectar as they excavate cavities looking for food. That's also, that's also what allows them to drink from hummingbird feeders and drain our hummingbird feeders. <laughs> when woodpeckers change their nest, nesting locations, um, both sexes excavate a new cavity in the fleshy part of the saguaro uh, when the breeding period is over. So not actually at the beginning, but when it's over, because it takes several months for the scar to form over um, over the newly excavated uh, cavity to create a hardened scar tissue. So this doesn't actually hurt the saguaro in itself um, because the scar tissue protects the soft tissue surrounding it. Now, gilda flakers, they like to make their nesting holes higher than Gila woodpeckers. And since they're bigger than uh, wood Gila woodpeckers, they 
excavate such a large hole that sometimes the tip of the saguaro um, just falls off. So if you see a saguaro that looks like someone chopped off its head, you know exactly who was the culprit of that. It's probably a gilded flicker. Woodpeckers reuse their nests for several years. I've witnessed this myself for the last five years at my house. This year, they actually made a new hole um, right above the old one. So I expect they'll be using that next year as it scars over. A tree cavity can be formed by natural events like peeling bark or splitting of heavy branches like Lucy warblers when they prefer for their nests. Uh, as you see on the very right side, that's a Lucy's warbler nest. Natural crevices in the tree trunk can also be expanded by fungi, bacteria, or of course, wildlife like, like woodpeckers. For example, ladder back woodpeckers are likely to nest in um, a dead or dying tree or even in a galve stalk. And of course, we have our nest boxes, the man-made option for birds to use. Nest boxes are made to specific preferences of a species, such as the entrance hole, design, and internal volume. These can be really useful for supplementing the natural cavities in the area to decrease competition and invite nesting birds to your yard. Cavities are used for, uh, by birds by, for various reasons. The primary reason is, of course, breeding, laying eggs, rearing young, all of that. During the off season, uh, like fall and winter, birds that don't migrate away will use the same or different cavity for roosting, which means sleeping during their inactive hours. For kestrels, it's during the night. For owls, for most owls, it's during the day. Some cavities are also used to escape the elements during the inclement weather. I recently saw this video of a downy woodpecker pictured here, <clears throat> seeking refuge in a nest box during Hurricane Ian in Florida. When you watch this video, you can hear that outside of the cavity, the winds are blowing, the rain is pouring, but that woodpecker was nice and dry inside and he weathered that storm in the nest box also was uh, perfectly fine the next day. Escape can also mean um, away from predators by dropping down into the bottom of the cavity. Most predators are bigger than our tiny cavity um, nesting raptors, so they can't get into the nest box. And guess what else likes cavities? Bugs. So birds like woodpeckers will often excavate a cavity as they look for bugs, or um, they'll get into a bigger cavity to look for bugs. We captured this Gila woodpecker going into an unoccupied owl nest box and using its tongue uh, to get a spider that was inside. Cavity nesters have interesting adaptations. There are a few different theories uh, going out, going around on egg coloration of birds in different types of nests. Most cavity nesters have white eggs, considering that they're um, they're laid in a deep dark hole. Some say that the white coloration helps the bird see the eggs with minimal light inside the cavity. Western screech owls, barn owls, they have white eggs. Gila woodpeckers, gilded flickers have white eggs. Birds that lay eggs in open cup nests, um, they, they benefit from a more camouflaged egg, like a speckled egg or a colored egg. But then we have ash-throated flycatchers and brown-crested flycatchers and Lucy's warblers and American kestrels who all have brown speckling on their eggshells. So it's possible that they simply evolved to um, use cavities in not too distant past in relative terms. So they simply just retain that trait. Another adaptation is longer time in the nest. 
chicks of cavity nesters can afford to spend more time in the nest because they're more protected and they can get stronger um, inside the safety of a nest box. They can even start exercising their wings inside the nest box and they're not forced to leave the nest as quickly as the vulnerable chicks in an open cup nest, for example. So let's dive into some species profiles of our tiny raptors. I thought, how am I going to organize these? So I thought I would organize them by size. And here we have our elf owls. Uh, they are the smallest raptor in the world, and we're lucky to have them here. They measure only 4.7 to 5.5 inches long and up only up to two ounces in weight. That's about as long as a house finch and only slightly heavier than that, than the house finch. They're overall mottled brown, gray, and white. They have white eyebrows and no ear tufts. Um, you may not always see them. You are more likely to actually hear their laughing call. So I'm gonna go ahead and play that so that you're familiar with what that sounds like. Mayo calling here. So if you're walking out in the desert at night in the spring and hear laughing from the dark desert, don't panic. It's probably an elf owl. Um, in fact, unlike our next species, uh, elf owls are strictly nocturnal and fairly common in good habitat. Most elf owls breed in three populations in the U.S.-Mexican borderlands, uh, southern Arizona, southwest New Mexico, and southwest Texas. They winter in southern Mexico. There are three other populations in southern Baja California and Pueblo, Mexico, and those populations are non-migratory. Elf owls can be found in desert, pine oak, riparian woodland habitats. Their current conservation status is described as low concern. Um, they are fairly common here during breeding season, but with urbanization and wildfire threats to saguaros, this may change in the future. Elf owls begin nesting in May. They utilize saguaro cavities and have only been known to use nest boxes in areas with no saguaros, um, like high, higher elevations. They don't make nests, so they will build on top of whatever already is in the cavity. Could be debris from excavating the cavity or could be someone else's old nest. And that's gonna be the common theme across all of our tiny raptors today. They don't bring in any nesting material. Um, so the female incubates a clutch of three to four white eggs uh, for about three weeks while the, the male uh, feeds her. Due to their small size, elf owls mostly eat large insects, but sometimes they do eat small reptiles, mammals, um, and after about a month after hatching, the chicks fledge the nest and spend a little more time outside of the nest cavity with the parents, um, learning how to fly, learning how to hunt on their own. And then they end up this um, finding their own territory and actually migrating south. Every spring, Tucson Audubon conducts night surveys in local important bird areas. Um, in Saguaro Park East, Saguaro Park West, Tucson Mountain Park. So keep an eye out for our emails in the spring if you'd like to participate, it's a lot of fun. A little fun fact about elf owls is that they can catch thread snakes, which are really small um, underground snakes, and they bring them to their nest alive. And the snake then eats the little parasites that may harm the little owl babies. So 
it keeps the nest clean. Owl fowls also, their nests often um, host ants, tree ants, which also help them clean up the meal remnants and nest parasites as well. So they're very resourceful like that. Next, we've got our ferruginous pygmy owls. They are 5.5 to 7 inches long, with females averaging larger than males, which is also common. Their plumage is generally mottled brown and white and no ear tufts. They also have these really dark feathers on the back of their heads, which act as decoys. They're called acelli. They are thought to confuse and deter predators because it looks like you're always watching no matter which way the actual eyes are facing. They have a very distinct call, which sounds like a monotonous beeping. I'm going to play it here. They're a crepuscular owl, which means they are most active at dawn and dusk, but they do hunt by day sometimes as well. In Arizona, they feed on reptiles, birds, small mammals, and insects as well. Ferruginous pygmy owls can be found in southeast tip of Arizona and the southern tip of Texas. They are more common in South America, as you can see here. They don't migrate, and in Arizona, these owls prefer desert washes with mature giant saguaros used for nesting. In Arizona, the species used to be listed as endangered. It was recently delisted and currently described as species of greatest conservation need. But they are currently proposed to be listed as threatened again. Their nesting begins about March or April. Each clutch contains three to five white eggs. Female incubates while the male feeds her. Nestlings fledge in late May or June, and juvenile pygmy owls remain with their parents for up to eight weeks after they leave the nest, again, learning to hunt and fly and get stronger. After that time, they disperse the way to establish their own territories. A little fun fact about these guys is that Phoenix Zoo has a conservation captive breeding program where they raise pop, uh, small broods of these owls to bring up their population numbers here in Arizona. They work closely with Arizona Game and Fish and US Fish and Wildlife Service um, they got their first owls for breeding in uh, 2018. They were paired for breeding behind the scenes at the Zoo's Conservation Center. And in May of 2019, the zoo celebrated its first successful breeding and hatching of these owls. They also use video cameras to monitor the owls so that they can document mating behavior egg incubation periods, fledging events, and parental behaviors, all things that are um, somewhat poorly documented currently. In 2021, they celebrated the first releases into the wild, into two sites in Southern Arizona. They're undisclosed. It's currently unknown how successful the captive bred owls are in the wild, but we hope to learn more once they have another update out. Then we've got our Western screech owls. Western screech owls in Arizona are gray overall with dark barring. Screech owls are masters at shape shifting, going from rounded little poofs on the right side to an elongated shape on the left side with their ear tufts out and blending into the tree behind it. They're about eight to nine inches long. And despite its name, the screech owls that we have don't actually screech. That part of their name is derived from their eastern cousins, the eastern screech owl, 
Westerns have a very pleasant bouncy ball call, which how I like to describe it. I'm gonna call, I'm gonna um, play it for you right now. <laughs> Possible. They're nocturnal hunters. They hunt small mammals like kangaroo rats, small pack rats, large insects, and small birds while they're sleeping. Western screech owls can be found across most of Arizona. Around Tucson, they tend to stick to lower elevations, while in Sky Islands, you may encounter its cousin, the whiskered screech owl. They look almost identical, but the whiskered has whiskers, like its name, and a lighter colored beak and talons. Here, you will find them mostly nesting in giant, giant saguaros, but across the range, they'll also nest in cottonwoods, oaks, aspens, and other trees. Like with elf owls, their conservation status is currently at low concern, but the issues threatening our giant saguaros, like buffalo grass fueled wildfires, can also affect these owls since saguaros take over 100 years to reach a large enough size to host these cavity nesters. Screech owls begin laying eggs very early, usually about March or April, uh, though we have seen it vary to February as well. They don't make a nest either. In natural cavities, they lay their eggs on the cavity floor. Screech owls lay three to five white eggs, and then the female incubates the eggs, and the male feeds her, like I'm with the other owls as well. A little fun fact, while screech owls are really tiny, they weigh about 10 ounces. They have been documented taking on prey that's much bigger and heavier than them, like a cottontail, cottontail rabbit. So they're mighty little guys. Finally, we've got the North America's smallest falcon. It's the American kestrel coming in at 8.7 to 12.2 inches in length. The male sports slate blue wings and the spotted chest, while the female wings are reddish brown and a streaky breast. Both sexes have vertical lines on their faces, kind of like sideburns or mustaches. Like the pygmy owls, kestrels have a set of false eyes on the back of their head to throw off any predators. They have a very distinctive call. It's um, Clee, clee, clee is the best that can really describe it without actually playing it, but here it is. That was quite loud on my end. Hopefully it didn't um, deafen you over there. Uh, kestrels are strictly diurnal hunters, uh, but they are hunting for whatever is most abundant in the area. It could be lizards, snakes, insects, small mammals, and of course, small birds. American kestrels are pretty widespread and mostly non-migratory. Kestrels occupy habitats ranging from deserts to grasslands to alpine meadows. They do like an open area to hunt where they can be seen hovering right before they pounce onto their prey. Their conservation status across, across the whole North America is currently low concern, but they are declining in Arizona specifically. Kestrels use tree cavities and saguaro cavities. They start laying eggs around March or April. Their clutch consists of four to five speckled eggs. It kind of blends in in this picture, but there are four eggs in this picture on the kind of mid, low to low left. I'm sure I pointed out right here. There they are. Unlike all the owls I covered today, both male and female develop brood patches to incubate the eggs. 
Incubation takes a month, followed by another month raising chicks inside the cavity. And have you ever felt like there's more kestrels around us during winter? Well, you're not, you're not imagining things because we have kestrels here year round, but in the winter, we get a larger number of them as they migrate from the northern parts of their range, so the Canada parts. They're also known to use different habitats in the winter. Females use typically open habitat and males will use an areas with more trees. The situation appears to be the result of the females migrating south first and claiming the best winter territories first, leaving males for more wooded areas, which are a little bit harder to hunt in. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Mike here um, to tell us a little bit about what Hawk Watch International has been um, studying in Tucson, which is quite recent actually. First of all, yeah. I want to check to see if you can hear me as I uh, jump back to the top of the coffee shop. It's a little quiet, Mike. Okay, I'll try, I'll try to speak up and I'll sit a little closer to you. Um, Hawk Watch runs a network of migration, fall migration out sites in the western U.S. And Mike, we were able to hear you a little bit better at the beginning, but now it's very, very faint. Mm -hmm. Something change, I wonder. I'm having a very hard time hearing. Apologies for that. Mm -hmm. That's still pretty bad. Is that working? It could be a connection thing if uh, you're using headphones or earphones. Yeah, well, I will pull my headphones off. How's that, Olya? Is that any better? That's much, much better. better. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay, uh, that was indeed uh, a headphone problem. Um, apologies for the audio. I just jumped out of my truck on the way back to Tucson from our Western migration sites. Um, we have eight sites around the Western U.S. where we count migrating raptors in the fall. And about 10 years ago, our counts started to show quite a decline in American kestrels. So we initiated a few projects to try to, uh, in partnership with Peregrine Fund and the American um, Kestrel Part Partnership, to determine kind of what's going on. We have 600 boxes in and around the Salt Lake City area, mid-continent in various uh, landscapes. We have about 50 up at the Canadian border. And as of two years ago, we initiated a, a Tucson component with, at this point we have 75 boxes uh, down and around Tucson, uh, extending down into Amato and over to Sonoida. Um, the purpose of the study was to look at population dynamics and see how the birds are utilizing landscapes, especially in areas of rapid growth. Salt Lake certainly uh, conformed to that, um, uh, to that description and Tucson as well, as, the, as I'm sure any of you from Tucson that are in this call, uh, you've seen the growth in your area. Um, we also, within the past three years, have um, uh, gotten into rodenticide, uh, particularly in Salt Lake. And we have three years worth of data there. And we're just starting to tease out some of the rodenticide effects on these small birds. I will probably um, expand that rodenticide into Tucson in the coming years. Um, in this study, we have uh, a certain percentage of boxes which we put up and we also encourage community scientists or citizen scientists to get involved uh, doing the same on their own um, their own landscape so a number of people will put up a box and then jump into our study and self-report data and we're encouraging anyone with an interest in that to, to get involved it requires about 
10 to 12 peaks inside the box over a period of, uh, like Olya said, the 30 days of, of uh, nesting and then the 30 days of um, inbox rearing until they fledge. So we started out many years ago using ladders because smartphones and little sport cameras weren't readily available. And now we have graduated into a much more um, easy routine and also less invasive, which is a small pole camera. And a typical visit um, takes probably a couple of minutes. And then the data takes maybe five minutes on your smartphone. So we are asking anyone with uh, a nest box to um, consider doing that. As the, the project started around kestrels, because that's what our data was showing us was in the climb, but the screech owls have become a very important component of that. We've had a, a pro project down in the Chiricahuas for many years looking at uh, small forest owls, which includes elf owls, uh, whiskers, flammulated owls, and the western screech owls. And there we don't use nest boxes. Part of that study is to determine what's happening with uh, natural cavities. So we map the cavities over time and we see how that correlates with nesting success. But because we do have that, uh, a lot of owl data in southeastern Arizona and we have a few uh, Westerns up in Salt Lake City. They've always been part of this program, but our surprise was when we came down to Tucson and put up boxes, the vast majority of our boxes got used by uh, Western screech owls. The first year, we only had one kestrel, which was along the Rieto River at Craycroft Road, but we probably had 18 or 20 Western screech owls. And that number has grown and that ratio has, has increased. Um, an interesting fact, uh, when Olia showed the nest boxes, uh, there was a Lucy's, I believe, and maybe a, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, maybe a Gila box. Um, and then also the large box that they sell in their gift shop. We find, which is very surprising to us, that the big boxes uh, are often occupied by both the male and the female screech owl. And we don't see that in any of our other locations, probably because the cavities are so small, although we don't know that for a fact. So just an interesting thing, if, if you decide to put up a nest box in your yard and you grab an Audubon uh, box from their gift shop, uh, there's a much higher chance of both birds using that box at the same time. We, we don't see that commonly in, in in natural cabins for smaller boxes. Um, we will do a training in early February, which will be an online Zoom thing uh, to cover all the basics on how to do it. And uh, I would encourage anyone uh, to put up a nest box and, and see what you get. Uh, whether you participate or not, it's certainly, uh, it's certainly helping these little birds. And uh, I hope to see you in the spring. Thanks, Olia. Thanks so much, Mike. I really appreciate you joining us from the road right now. Um, I know it's kind of distracting being in a cafe setting, but we appreciate getting all this uh, really good information about it. This, I'm so excited to learn what you all find out um, about the Tucson area kestrels and screech owls. Like Mike mentioned, we sell these nest boxes that are a little bit bigger than a natural cavity. Well, actually, it's much bigger than a natural cavity. And the reason for that is they, they can spread their wings. They, um, we had last year five baby screech owls. And as you can imagine, it got pretty crowded um, as they grew. The mom stayed with them the whole time and the dad actually stayed with them in the same nest boxes. While in the natural cavity, the dad would, stop, would start uh, roosting away from that nest box quite early on. And then the female would be kind of left to take care of the babies. But with our big box, they can all kind of stay in the same nest box. And what we saw later on is that the babies would start uh, practicing their wing flaps inside the safety of a nest box too. So it's pretty awesome. 
also wanted to point out something um, on Mike's picture here, which I recently learned, and I think it's one of the coolest things, <laughs> but um, you can always tell which egg was laid last in a kestrel clutch because it's going to be lighter than the other ones. And it's kind of like they run out of ink by the end. And I think it's so funny. <laughs> All right. So if you're interested in helping tiny raptors on your property, um, there are some best practices that I wanted to mention. Dying trees and limbs called snags provide vital habitat for wildlife. Raptors use it for hunting, um, perching while they're looking for prey. Woodpeckers eat the bugs that um, start eating at the dead tree or dying tree. They also make holes to nest and roost in. Um, Wherever it's safe, leave them up to be used by wildlife. This is often done by decreasing the canopy of the tree so it cannot easily topple over or drop limbs on somebody. A uh, certified arborist can guide you on your journey to wildlife trees. Uh, Tucson Urban Forestry has been doing that already, so they're doing awesome work. Please don't use rodenticides or open sticky glue traps to protect the birds. If you use rat poison, you would be killing the owls in the area because the mouse, as it gets poisoned, doesn't immediately die. It could become lethargic, get caught by an owl. The owl eats it and dies. So the owls themselves are providing the ecological service of pest control, so don't use pest control or don't use rodenticides around your property. Consider planting a saguaro in your next landscaping project. It's an investment since they are so slow growing. It takes them like 100 to 150 years to get big enough and, and be used for cavities, but it's good to have a start somewhere. You can also protect the existing saguaros by removing the invasive buffalo grass that causes um, cactus killing wildfires. If it's not on your property, then you can join us for organized buffalo grass pools that are led by Desert Museum or Tucson Audubon. Western screech owls and American kestrels, like we mentioned, take up to nest boxes really well. If you're interested in installing a nest box for a tiny raptor, we have you covered. We offer a nest box design at our nature shop that suits both screech owls and kestrels. We've recently added a new design um, that looks amazing by a local artist. It has saguaro ribs on the outside. So it looks very um, artsy and can fit into your backyard aesthetic. If you'd like to build your own nest box, we do offer plans online. Our website is currently under construction. So if you just email me for now, I'll be able to send you a plan. The best time to install the nest box is fall because many young owls um, and kestrels are dispersing away from their parents during this time and they seek their own territories. Um, it also allows for the nest box to be ready once the owls and the kestrels start pairing up in early spring. Each nest box has directions on installation specific to the bird you are targeting. And I'm also happy to guide you through the process by email, so don't hesitate to reach out. Of course, putting up a nest box at any time of year is good because it can be used for roosting, not just nesting. As with any nesting birds, we encourage people to be respectful of the nesting raptors during the sensitive time. Keep a distance from the nesting tree or saguaro. And if you're monitoring a nest box, um, like Mike mentioned, there is a nest camera and it takes so little time to actually check the nest boxes nowadays. Some people, including us, even install live cameras inside the box, so we don't even have to open the box, but it's certainly not required. Uh, I usually just prepare all my equipment to check the nest box 
before I approach the mess box so that I don't fumble with my equipment nearby. Of course, if we're inviting birds to our yard for foraging and nesting, we bear the responsibility of their safe passage and interaction in the habitat. Now they're closer to buildings and much higher danger of a window strike. So prevent collisions by making your windows visible to birds by using decals or other methods of your choosing. All designs must be visible from at least 10 feet away and must be on the outside of the glass. And there are some specs on how big the decals must be, but the two by two spacing of the design is the most important part because the birds don't want to have a feeling like they can fly through. If they can, they think they'll, they can fly through, they will. And our tiny hummingbirds will try to fly through anything bigger than two by two. Also, this information is available on our website and a nature shop. Um, so we're here to help you. If you love to see tiny raptor families, please tune into our live webcams during spring season. Since 2019, we've been watching two raptor families on camera. Both are located on the northwest side of Tucson. One we've named um, very affectionately Howie and Holly. They're a Western screech owl family we, we've been watching since 2019. And last year they laid five eggs and for the first time all five hatched and they all five successfully fledged from the nest. About two miles from this box, there's an American Kestrel box family and the family there are Falco and Kay. They're, each one is named by the homeowners in which yard they're in. They also raised five healthy chicks last year and we're excited to see them again next season. The cameras we use, if you're interested, are called Google Nest camera and they're just a security camera that runs off either battery or Wi-Fi, uh, either battery or plug-in and they need Wi-Fi to connect to for you to be able to see inside the nest box in real time. The cameras that I'm talking about usually go live around February or March, and that's when the activity picks up and we start seeing the, um, the pairs show up in the nest boxes. So I made sure to leave plenty of time to answer any questions, and I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing for now. Now, so I can see you and see if there's any questions that may have come up. Awesome. Thank you so much, Olya, and thank you, Mike, for sharing about your research. That was uh, just so interesting. We do already have a couple of questions. Um, so uh, one question that came in from Patty is, what nest box would make sense in a midtown urban yard, uh, in perhaps a large sweet acacia tree, but, or just in general in the midtown yard for folks here? So it's possible that a kestrel might nest in a place like that. You just have to get it up high enough um, for a kestrel to consider moving in there. But in a place like that, I would recommend other nest boxes like a Lucy's or a flycatcher would do really well in, the, um, in a yard like that. A screech owl would likely not be in Midtown. Makes sense. <laughs> Want a little more room, I imagine. Mm -hmm. um, and Carl asks if there is a specific direction that the hole should face, um, as they have had screech owls, but not any uh, owl nesting activity. So, Mike, do you have a experience with what you've had the most um, successful? Because we've done every single direction. <laughs> um, yes, actually literature suggests that uh, southeast exposure probably gets the most usage and th this is uh, uh, nationwide. 
Um, in Tucson, I don't think it's uh, compass direction per se. It's more about shade. Uh, heat is in, in, in the, the ter determining factor of nest success here. Um, two years ago, there was a huge uh, temperature spike. I think it went to 115 in the third week of May when a lot of chicks were getting ready to fledge and, and quite a few were lost because of that. So I think shade is the biggest factor, but the literature does suggest Southeast is good. I think the, the reasoning being they get morning sun, um, so it, it warms up the, the nest quickly, but then in the afternoon they get shade from whatever the substrate is. But um, just find a good spot that's as high as you, you can get your nest box and make sure it's shaded, at least for the Tucson area. Yeah, that's an excellent point. And that can be on the tree itself, as long as there's no branches in the front of it, because that could provide access for predators to get into the nest box. Or you can put it up on the pole in the shade of a tree. So there's some options there. Um, one, one quick uh, note on that. Uh, you notice that the kestrel eggs were are kind of mottled brown. And Olya alluded to the fact that, that maybe that was an evolutionary trait. And indeed, uh, kestrels started as cliff nesters. So they readily adapt to cavities or boxes that are put on houses. And I think the reason being is that that replicates kind of a, a cliff face. So they like big vertical walls. So if you do have a north facing wall that's uh, dying for a box, uh, you might have a higher success for a kestrel if you put it there. Very cool. I had no idea they used to be cliff nesters. That's neat. Um, okay, one more question that came into the chat is uh, Brendan asked if um, the boxes need wood shavings in the owl box. Uh, they say there's already a western screech owl in residence, so they're not sure if they should disturb it to add shavings. Yes, we recommend about two to three inches of wood shavings or wood chips on the bottom of an owl box or a kestrel box because they don't make their own nests. They need a little bit of insulation and to protect the eggs from rolling around too much. Um, and you would typically clean out the nest box about once a year uh, before nesting season or like in the fall. Uh, if you're saying that the, the screech owls are in the nest box right now, I would say maybe doing it after um, dusk, once they've left for the night, would be a good way not to disturb them too much. Um, sometimes if you also peek in with a little camera, they're not going to be in the box every single night, but I guess um, if you're seeing them every night, then they're probably in there. But dusk is probably going to be your best bet. OK, we just got another question come through. Do you recommend, I don't know how to say this word. Diatomaceous earth. Thank you. <laughs> I've heard of that. So do you recommend it for nest box or lice or other parasites? So I know that people use diatomaceous earth for like ants and things like that in their yards and it's like safe for pets but I've never heard of anyone using it in a nest box and my worry would be that it would be something inhaled by the birds so I would probably recommend not doing that and um, trusting that the natural um, the natural process would be plenty for them in in a saguaro they wouldn't have a choice. So the only thing that we do to help them out is cleaning out the nest box between seasons. And that seems to be plenty to not accumulate parasites between seasons. Great. Um, are there any other questions um, coming through either in the chat or if you want to- That's really yourself? interesting. Um, yeah, sorry, I just wanted to say I'll look into diatomaceous earth. I've never heard of it being used that way. And so um, it's good to hear that it's successful there. So thank you for putting that in the chat. And yeah, if you have any questions you'd prefer to ask, you know, by unmuting yourself, that's totally fine with me. Thank you all for really kind words. We are so glad you enjoyed it.
if people are interested, I do have, you're welcome to stick around if there are no other questions, but I wanted to also play a, a little video that's gonna be taking us to the end of this presentation. And it's a little story about our screech owls and our live cameras. And if you want to stick around and watch it, feel free to, but of course um, you don't have to. So I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing.
That was a fun one to put together. So oh, just so cute. <laughs> Uh, they're so fun to watch. Um, let's see. I hope I answered some of the questions as they were coming in. I'll see. Are there plans to maybe put a camera facing the nest box and tree outside? That's actually one of the things I want to do this year because I really want to know what's going on on the outside. Sometimes we'll hear them calling like right outside the nest box, talking to little babies, but we can't see them. So definitely something we want to do this spring. Um, how long? Oh, good. Oh, yeah, the video. So yeah, about one to three months, they'll be learning how to fly and hunt and then find their own territories. Thank you all so much. I will include the link to this video in the follow up email when uh, Kirsten's going to send out the recording to everybody so that you can you know, watch it again or share it. Um, so thank you all so much for coming. Our emails will also be included in the follow-up email. Yep, uh, and uh, I'll ask, uh, Mike mentioned that there are some um, training workshops coming up. So I'll ask him to share that information with me so I can also send that out to all of you. Um, so thank you all so much for, for spending the last hour with us. That was so much fun, um, especially that video. Thank you, Olya. Um, and thank you to both Olya and Mike for, for sharing their knowledge with us today. That was really awesome. And we, we hope to see you again soon. So thank you, have a good rest of your day. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day.